Good morning. Isn't it hard to believe, it is for me, that here we are at another Christmas. Wow. And you know, through all the darkness, and there's lots of darkness going on in these days, some in our lives, certainly all around us too, the Lord Jesus cuts through that as the light of the world. Amen? And I hope that if you can, we that's the, the purpose of our meeting on Christmas Eve, is to worship Him. And it's really a, a special time. And I hope that if you can, and bring your neighbors and your kin folks that are visiting with you, and, and uh, we're going to focus on Jesus Christ, the light of the world. So we encourage you to come out to that. Now, I've got a message today out of Hebrews chapter 1 that's way beyond, way up here, and I'm way down there, well, we're going to do the best we can because we're going to try to deal with who is Jesus. And that may just sound like, well, that's a silly question. No, it's not. It's something that we all need, and it's something that certainly the world needs, but even us, we need this too. We need to be reminded of who He is. I was thinking of the words of Christ in John 14 and in verse 9, where Philip had asked him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And what did Christ say? He says, have I been so long with you, and you have not come to know me, Philip? Have I been so long with you, and you have not come to know me? Well, this morning, I just want us to be reminded of who this Jesus is at this time of the year, that the world has its form of celebration, and I trust that God's people have a better form of celebration of who He is, and I just want us to look at that uh, just a little bit out of the, the book of Hebrews, the writer unknown, and uh, but it's the inspired Word of God and see what we can come to conclusions as we look at this particular book. So would you bow with me in prayer as I ask God to help us in our, this time. Father, we thank you that you sent a Messiah, the perfect Messiah, into the world. We thank you that he makes all the difference about everything. Truly everything revolves around him. And I pray that as we look into your precious, holy, infallible word, that you would remind us who he is and that would bring great comfort and peace and joy. And Father, greater degrees of love as we consider him this morning. Help us to have a right attitude during this time of the year and really all the times, Lord, but especially now as we meet and greet people and as the doors are opened that you would help us to point them to the only one, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. In the past number of years, many people, and there's been many discussions on the talk shows and so forth, even battling over whether the holiday historically called Christmas can continue to be called Christmas. Isn't that silly? But it's more than silly. It's evil. But it's all part of the darkness around us, and most only have the vaguest idea of what is supposedly celebrated, and by that, who Jesus really is. Some think that he's just another term for Santa Claus, unfortunately. Another religious figure, and many people are using the name Jesus, but go no further than sentimentality. Or some, some think that, well, he's just a person who taught love and, and, and started a movement and, 
and uh, got a bunch of people fanatical and whatever. And others claim Christ and Christianity but are so consumed with self-centeredness that they've really never maybe either heard or indulged to know little of Him. And all these have a Jesus unlike the one that is described in Scripture. In fact, it is so rich in Scripture that we cannot possibly plumb the depths of it. And it's no wonder the situation is clouded. I recently heard someone describe the actual coming of Christ in this way as compared to the so-called celebration today. So I'm going to read what I recorded of this. This person said, Today a mythical, overweight, but supernatural Santa who slides down chimneys versus the truly supernatural Son of God whose words are not ho, 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 but His words are life-changing. Today there is furious activity, elaborate displays, traffic madness, in case you hadn't noticed, impossible schedules versus the pronouncement of true peace on earth, a phrase that is misunderstood, of course. The birth of Christ was into poverty, and yet today it is supposedly celebrated in wealth, and billions are spent on the temporal with the emphasis on indulgence. Wise men came originally supernaturally recognizing Him, but today, sadly, there is little wisdom or true recognition of who this baby, born in poverty, in a stinky stable, in a manger, really is. And I mean, who is he? Not just a remarkable story of this hardship and poverty and the fact that Mary had to walk up mountains and over rocks and rugged terrain, if you've ever been over there, some 90 miles between Nazareth and Bethlehem for a silly census. But who is he really? We just sung the hymn that I love dearly. Who is he and yonder stall at whose feet the shepherds fall? Tis the Lord, the King of glory. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. Well, that's what I want us to look at today. And really, any true essence of Christmas is going to be seen or understood in, in, the, in identifying Christ, but more our faith and our purpose in meeting and worshiping Him, uh, in living, really, in living, is all wrapped up in who is He? In yonder stall. So look at Hebrews with me that we just heard David read. And this is a synopsis here where the writer of Hebrews under inspiration is trying to build the platform of faith for these Hebrew Christians who may be wavering and they're under persecution and trouble to not turn back, to not turn away, that, to, that to just realize it's all built on who he is and it's the same for us today in the life that we're leading and the difficulties of life that we're facing, and all the trials, the temptations, and the problems that exist. It's he who is in yonder stall that has to do with everything. Notice we read, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, and in many portions, in many ways, in these last days, and we are privileged to be in those last days, has spoken to us, in His Son. There it is. Everything emanates from Him. God has determined the means of knowing Him, and that means is by His Word. That's what He's saying here. In our reading, the inspired writer here will make seven, if, and really there's more than that, but there are seven 
key statements about Christ, and each sets his glorious, unique identity to be adored and should be an increasing issue for our love and affection towards him. And we're only going to be able to touch on this, and I'm going to be jumping all over the place, so you'll have to forgive me, and I'll try to hope you can follow along as I extract some things from this particular portion. Now notice he says, beginning there, God, after he spoke in the, in the prophets and in many portions and in many ways, and I've called this the summit of God's rev, rev, excuse me, revelation, can't talk, he says through the prophets, and that's people like Moses and Samuel and Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and Micah and etc., Malachi, so forth and so on, and many portions in many ways. How did he speak to us? He speaks to us in the creation that he made. Romans chapter 1, historic events and dreams and burning bushes and visions and symbols and miracles and all forms of narrative, prose, poetry, and songs, and all forms of language. He even spoke to us through a donkey at one time. Isn't that amazing? Is God limited? <laughs> no. But all of that was incomplete until Jesus Christ came. Each pointed to Jesus Christ. He says they testify of me, and the same... He said that on the road, to remember, to Emmaus? All of the Old Testament, and he exposed it to them, and their eyes were enlightened. They testify of me. And in the same, his son speaks to us today because he is the Word, isn't he? Remember John 1, 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this son, this preposition here in his son in means in union with not a lesser or mere messenger he is revealing himself by the son son is both the means and the object he is the word and the word is the completed revelation of him this is all amazing when you think about it he is the object the messenger and the message <laughs> isn't that amazing Look with me, jump, jump forward to Hebrews chapter 4 for a minute, where we can see how the Word and Him are really fitted together. You know this passage, Hebrews 4.12, talking about the power, the glory, the majesty of God's Word and what it does. Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now that right there is 16 sermons right there, okay? But we're not doing that. But that's the power and the beauty and the miraculous activity of the Word of God in its essential nature. And why? Because it's inseparable from Christ Himself. Look at the ver next verse. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. Who is his sight here? Look at the next verse. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has been passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. He's talking about the inseparability of one minute he's talking about the Word and the power and life and glory of that Word, and the next minute, the Son of God. Because they are inseparable, and that's why John would say in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John talks about, in John 1, 14, we beheld His glory. Glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And he was talking about an observation of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of his writing he talks about if I tried to write everything that he did during the time the, the books of all the world would not be filled up with enough uh, concerning him he is the infinite God but we are given just what we need to behold his glory in the word and so Christ himself is God's message and his messenger, and he's left nothing in reserve so that as we study 
the Son. We are also studying the Father. Because as I started reading about the encounter with Philip that Christ had, have I been so long with you, Philip, that you didn't know me? He says, if you have seen me, you have also seen the Father. God has given us a full view of himself through Jesus Christ. As we consider the baby, which is what happens at Christmas, the manger, and all the Christmas trappings, you and I must look beyond that with eyes of love and wisdom and affection at Jesus Christ. See him not as just the manger baby, but as God working mysteriously in revealing himself. Because Christmas does, I think, have value as we recognize Christ, the God of the Bible. And in that sense, of course, he is the summit of revelation. And as we study him and delight in his word and settle for nothing less, guess what? It changes you and me. It changes you and me just the same as when the disciples, other than Judas, who was of the devil, when the disciples walked with him those years, oh, just like on the road to Emmaus, my, didn't our hearts burn within us because they beheld his glory. And that's why the Apostle Paul, of all the stuff in his life, and all the religion that he had, and he, that he ended up calling it just a bunch of trash. He ended up saying, oh, that I may know him. That I may know him. Okay, so that's what we're here today, to just look at a little glimmer of that. And so getting back to this, and let me jump in at the second part of verse 2, where in these last days he's spoken to us as his son. Notice, whom he appointed heir of all things, whom he appointed heir of all things. This is his glory, because he is the focal point of all history and the goal of all history. He is the end of all things. There was no election held and uh, where people, and that's you might think that today because of all this self-centeredness that goes on, and even self-centeredness in the theology of so many, that, you know, it was all about them more than it is about Christ himself. But he is God the Father's heir. And that means that his position is one of lordship, lordship over all creation. He is the possessor and the judge over everyone and everything. And we are to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and worship him and obey him. In fact, Christ himself said, you know this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And part of that understanding built upon love is to know him, isn't it? Because I believe to know him is to love him. And he is the one here in this heir that is given David's eternal promised throne, and that is the Davidic covenant over in 2 Samuel 7. And that's why we have, when we look at Christmas time, and we have these elaborate genealogies that are found in Matthew 1 and in Luke chapter 3, because it is showing us his purposeful right in every direction and at every angle to be the heir of God. He has the final say. And he would even say in Matthew 28 at the Great Commission, he says, All authority, all authority has been given me both in heaven and in earth. Skip ahead to something we didn't read on Hebrews 1. Look down at verse 8. Now these are quotes out of the Old Testament, some of them out of Psalm 72. He says, But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. 
And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Wow. Your throne is forever and ever. And you know that in Revelation 19, what's he going to do? He's going to come to the earth the second time. And he's going to destroy all the enemies of God, all the enemies against Christ, all those who have neglected him, all those who have ignored him. They will face judgment and eternal damnation because of the rejection of Christ himself, God's heir. Hallelujah. And so the at issue is this. Do you believe what God has written through inspiration about His Son, our Sovereign Lord, this person who is Jesus Christ? He won't come again as a baby. He will come as a conquering, mighty, eternal, glorious king. And so, in this text, going back, and I'm jumping around and I realize that, look at verse 3. It says, and he, speaking of Christ, is the radiance of his glory. Christ has the coexistence of deity. He is God. Radiance here means outraying or outshining the physical manifestation and presence of God's glory. That's why over in Isaiah 7 that was spoken of earlier, he is spoken of as that one that was coming that would be Emmanuel, which means God with us. He is not just saying in that that the Son is of the same essence, which he is, but that Jesus Christ's role is to present God to us, is to present God to us. He is the image, Colossians 1.15 tells us, of the invisible God. We call this theologically the hypostatic union where God and man came together in this mysterious one person and that he alone can be and do He says here he is the radiance of his glory. And yet at the same time we are told in Scripture in Isaiah 48, God says that I will have no other gods before me. And we know that that is the first commandment concerning idolatry. But here he says he is exact, correctar, which means an engraving, the same as the Father, an exact representation of his nature. And this exactness means no less God than the Father in sovereignty and omnipotence and omniscience and veracity and love and all of the other characteristics that are true with God alone are true with Christ himself. And so as the Father, so is the Son. And if there were the slightest difference in attributes, the Father could not be fully satisfied with Him nor represented by Him. Think of that. There were were those back in that day and there are those today who believe that Christ is just another creation of God. And that's what is meant by the only begotten of the Father which that's not what it's talking about. That's talking about his humanity and his birth in humanity. And But here he says in verse 4, look at at that for a moment, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Now that is, in some sense, I think, a poor rendering. Having become is genomahi, which really means accomplished, And the much there means vastly. And the more there is kriton, which means nobler. So we could better read this as having accomplished vast nobility, far exceeding angels, being the heir of all authority. In other words, as powerful and special as angels, God's creation, there is yet no comparison with Christ. 
And so down in verse 5, he asked a rhetorical question. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Which one? Again, he will not share his glory. Now, this was tested, of course, by Satan. And we can read of Satan in Ezekiel 28 and in Isaiah 14. I will be like the Most High, but he can't be. He's wicked. And he's desperate. He is not the Son of God. Nor could he ever be. Because the Son of God is God. That's what he's saying here. Down in verse 6, he is worshipped by angels. Notice this. And when he, came, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Angels are not to worship another angel. And people are not to worship another angel. Look down at verse 8. This really tells it all. But he, he says, but of the Son, he says, your throne... O oh God is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of His kingdom. What does He do there? Of the Son, He says, your throne, O oh God. He's calling the Son God. You see, that settles it, doesn't it? Jesus, who is this Jesus? He is God. He is the exclusive, holy, and glorious person of God, becoming a man to redeem us to communicate God the Father to us. And what do you think that God would do to anyone that puts their attention and their focus anywhere else or above Him or beyond Him or ignore Him or any of those things? You see, that's what this life is all about, a testing ground for us. What place does this one have? Who is Jesus? Is He first place in you? That he, as Paul said, might come to have first place in everything. And that includes you and me. That he might come to have first place in everything. This is the baby that came in what we call Christmas, the Jesus of Christmas. And in verse 3, going back up there, and also he says... And he upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, sometimes when I try to put my arms around that and think of how he came in such a tawdry fashion to teenagers Mary and Joseph, poor, <laughs> in the most despicable situation, born in a stable. I know we try to make it look pretty, but it really wasn't pretty. It's a cave. A smelly cave where animals, and if you've been around animals very much, and if you're in a cave with them, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. That's not a pretty picture. This is that baby of Christmas, and yet it says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, it might be assumed by some that Christ was only somehow an agent for creation. No. He upholds all things, but he's also the sovereign over all active providence. It is all in his power. Now, we look out here and the, and the scientists tell us, which I can't even comprehend, that there's stars and, and uh, 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 there's all these different uh, celestial, um, I lost my, look, my thought, all these things that are celestial, stars and all kinds of things, solar systems and other systems out there, the galaxies, by, they say there's billions of galaxies. And these things are so far away, they're hundreds of millions of light years, 186,000 miles per second away from us. And he holds this baby, Jesus in the manger, holds all of this in his power. The psalmist tells there's not one of them missing. Not one of them. And I was thinking to myself, do you realize that what that's saying? You ever go out and look at the ground? I've got a grandson back there that likes to look at bugs all the time. You know, I don't think there's a square inch 
of dirt, at least in my place, that doesn't have ants in it. Did you know there's not an ant that's ever existed that isn't in the power of Jesus Christ? He has every ant predetermined in his power, and they all have their purpose in time. That's amazing to me. And you could say that of the molecules and the fish of the sea, and everything else. There is not anything on earth not under his divine purpose. And you see, what he's saying here is the ID of his worthiness, that this is the Jesus of Christmas. And yet, he's also a man. Down at verse 5, at the latter part there, he says, Today I have begotten you. He's birthed you. Not created. He's already existed. In fact, Christ talks about that in John 17 when he's praying the high priestly prayer. He says, With the glory I had with you before the world was. So he's this human baby by the Holy Spirit of Matthew chapter 1, and verse 22 and 23, through a virgin predicted as in Isaiah 7, and this is the incarnation, meaning in flesh. That's what incarnation means, that God has taken on flesh. God the Son took to Himself an additional nature, the nature of a man that He Himself created. Try to put your arms around that. He came and was born as any other baby, and grew in development as any other boy. And we're told of that in Scripture in Luke chapter 2. He got tired, and he ate, and he slept, and he hurt. And so he fulfills the promise that we're given of the suffering Savior for which he came for in Isaiah 53. He came to die, and he came to die as a man. God can't die. Only a man can die, and he took our sins, and the wages of sin is death. And he did it to represent fallen humanity. He had to be a man to, to take our place of sins. He had to be a man to become an intermediary between God the Father and us. He had to be a man to suffer and die. He had to be a man to be David's promised heir. The wisdom of God, the wonder of it. And you think about the creative ability of God to determine all of these things. You know, one of the things that I know I do in life is I'm often trying to determine, what is God doing now? When I'm facing problems and difficulties, what is God doing now? You can't figure it out. <laughs> You'll never figure it out. You have to just rest in Him. Because you can't figure it. And you certainly couldn't. Nobody could have ever figured out how he was going to redeem mankind. We search the scriptures to this day trying to drink in the depth of it. And that's what we're doing now. And then let me back up and say in verse 2b here, he says, through whom he also made the world. Now, all you kids, in fact, even back in my day, I was taught that evolution, that something from nothing in a matter of billions of years could bring about something. And we were all tadpoles, and then we became people and whatever. And the foolishness of that, when we were very clearly told, who made us? How, who designed all this? Who in wisdom did all of this? It's Christ Jesus and the interesting thing here is made the world. The usual term for world is cosmos, but here it's the word aeon, which is the idea of the ages. In other words, it's not just the world, but he has designed everything through a plan. Throughout the ages of time, time is his creation. The ages are His creation. He is the creator of substance and time. As Colossians 1.16 tells us that everything was made by Him and nothing was made that was not made by Him. And by the way, 
people are creative. In that sense, we have some of the image of God. But all we're doing is moving elements around. <laughs> he created ex nihilo something from nothing. Nothing. So grasp the magnitude of the baby in the manger as the creator of every star and every molecule and all the elements and all the processes that sustain life and even the body which Jesus himself bore, Jesus himself created it. And sometimes when I think of that and realize of my problems and my issues, and let me bring that back to home with each one of you because all of you here, almost all of you, if rare if you don't have problems, and some of you have severe problems in this congregation. He told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Who can imagine the place that Christ is preparing for his own? Try to, try to think of that. I know we get some picture over in Revelation 21 and 22, but we can't even begin to imagine. And so the song that says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus, let's look at Him now. Let's recognize Him now. And He was called at birth Christ the Lord meaning by Lord that we belong to Him. And so let's be sure that we live our life belonging to Him. And then in verse 3, he talks about, he says here, upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty of, on high. It speaks of his completed work from the shame of the cross to the right hand of God, proving it is perfectly finished and he is exalted. And the right hand, of course, is the most glorious position of authority. In fact, I, I, I need to get you to turn to Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. We have to just jump in here and look at verse 19. And what is the surpassing greatness of His power? That's Christ's power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, the very thing we're talking about. Notice this, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. Notice, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. You see, he's saying, get your head on right. Consider who this Jesus really is. He's set down. This work is finished at the right hand. And he says in this same text here that 3b, when he had made purification of sins. That redemption is so personal. It's the purpose He came to die. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and be a ransom for many, Mark says. And this is an exclusive act. One alone He could accomplish, and He alone is thereby to be trusted and worshipped. And that's why the Scriptures proclaim, Paul says to the Philippians, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And so God has provided for us all of this in Christ. And this is the real Christmas, you see, for you and me, lovers of Christ, believers in Christ. And he's also given us a picture here of the magnitude of this. And I, I want you to go with me, if you will, back to Psalm 19, Psalm 19, and you may have seen this before, but this is 
study to show thyself approved unto God and, and the richness of what he presents in his word. He gives us contrast. He gives us pictures. And in Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, The heavens are telling of the glory of the Lord, of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Now, I want you to notice that little phrase. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Hmm. The vastness, the magnitude of what's out there is incomprehensible. We're not even a speck. The earth is not even a speck. Our solar system is not a speck. And yet it is the work of his hands. Now notice over in Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah 45. Or Isaiah 45. Look at verse 12. Isaiah says something similar. It is I, speaking for God, who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands and ordained all their host. I stretched out the heavens with my hands hands. And literally in the Hebrew, that's finger work. It's a finger work of God. Now, flip over a little further in Isaiah to Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. Look at verse 10. Now, our context is moving into the suffering Savior. And notice what he says about him. Beginning in verse 10 of 52. The Lord has bared His holy arm. We're no longer talking about handwork. We're, not, we're talk, no longer talking about finger work. We're talking about He's flexing His bicep, as it were, for a picture for us. God is showing at the right hand, which is always the place of almighty power, of the most power, he is flexing that for us. The Lord has bared His holy arm in the sight of all the nations that all the ends of the earth may see what? The salvation of our God. Now flip over to Isaiah 53 and verse 1. This great passage speaking of Christ on the cross. He says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? There it is. Not finger work. And I'm suggesting to you that the most powerful and wonderful and glorious thing at the extent of almighty power was Christ Jesus coming in the form of a man in a, as a baby. That's Christmas. And dying on a cross... For sinners, God has bared His holy arm. God has bared His holy arm. And that's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. What is that price? God bared His holy arm. Now that's the real Christmas. And I know we've just touched on it. And the summation of this is so beyond our comprehension that we're just up here piddling around and I feel so inadequate and, and I am inadequate. And so as we consider Christmas, it's not enough to say it's about Jesus. Jesus. Because we have to have in our mind, who is this Jesus that we're referring to that, that supposedly the world celebrates with all the stuff that it is? Are you celebrating him in your heart with thankfulness and gratitude beyond measure because of who he is and what God did and giving us the only Redeemer that could really save us from our terrible, terrible mess of sin that we're in in closing and I'm going to just if you look with me at Revelation chapter 1 here is the Lord Jesus unveiled 
not like in the manger, but unveiled. Let me just read it without comment, beginning in verse 12. Here's John speaking on the Isle of Patmos. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he had seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. That's the unveiled Christ. And what did John do? When I saw him, I got up and slapped him on the back. No. I fell at his feet like a dead man. But look at the graciousness of Christ. He placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one and I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. I'm the answer to everything that's really important. This is the Jesus that we long to worship and serve in this church, and I trust that you are longing to serve and worship Him and follow Him with your life. That's what it is all about. Who is He in yonder stall? Tis the Lord, O wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At His feet we humbly fall. Crown Him, crown Him. Lord of all. Father, we ask you to help each one of us, oh, to know you and worship you and adore you with our lives and from the heart. Speak to us, gracious Father. If there's someone in the sound of my voice that knows you not, oh, Lord, we pray that you would set forth your spirit upon them and help them and open their blind eyes that they might have true hope, that they might have a relationship with you that will shine forth through all eternity. Thank you for this time with you, Father. We do worship our Lord Jesus. Thank you for sending him to the earth and the blessing that he is. Oh, thank you, thank you, Father. We praise Thee. Amen. Today has been a wonderful preamble to the Christmas weekend we have next week. Our hymns that we all shared in this morning were very appropriate for the Christmas season, as was the song that our dear sister sang for us. And, and of course, the, the word and the message that was given is very appropriate for the Christmas message. And now we come to the Lord's table and how appropriate the Lord's table is for the Christmas message. And I find the fact that we have this little crash or manger scene sitting and sharing the space with the elements is quite appropriate as well. Paul tells us in Philippians 2 verses 6 and following that Jesus Christ entered into humanity, the light of God's glory veiled in flesh, emptied himself of his divine privileges like omniscience and omnipresence. While never emptying himself of his deity, he became fully human born of a virgin, born of a child, or born a child, rather. Because he put on humanity, as one would put on a cloak, he was prepared to live the life, the perfect human life, 
of obedience to God's will. Hebrews 10.5 says, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And in verse 7, he says, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. It was the will of God that he would offer his life of righteousness for our life of sin. Hebrews 10.10 says, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And this is, of course, what Paul is speaking of in 2 Corinthians 5.21 when he says, He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It is appropriate that the manger shares the space with the Lord's table. As we look at this scene, we notice the child in a manger, a feeding trough. Jesus came to bring life to all who would trust in him. And he said in John 6, 35, that I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will not thirst. As we partake of the bread and the juice, it's a reminder of his life and his death that nourishes us and fills us and gives us life. In him. Paul told us as we do this in faith, we proclaim his death until he comes. Jim talked about at the very beginning how dark the world is. And it is. The world is very dark. But I would argue that it's not as dark as it was when Christ came into the world. For he was the light of God's glory who broke into the dark world. We have Christ and his spirit in the world today. And he will come again. We, we proclaim his death. And Christmas is all about his coming. And we should be remembering that he's coming again. Let us pray. Father, as we come to the table, we give thanks to you for your son, Jesus Christ. What an amazing gift it is, and oh, how needed we are all sinners, Father, in need of your mercy and your grace and the idea that you would come into the world.